So here's a bonus section. You're not responsible for the material on this, but that shouldn't stop you from listening, right? Because the goal is learning. But I will never test you on this, but I think it's interesting. I kind of passed over and said, let's stay to take care of giving you confidence intervals for relative risk serology ratios. And we'll spend more time on these measures in the second term. But I want to try and give you some sense of what goes on behind the scenes with them. And it turns out the sampling behavior, the random sampling behavior ratios, like the relative risk or odds ratio, if we were to do multiple studies on the same populations with the same sample sizes randomly taken from two groups over and over again and compute multiple measures of association for each study, multiple relative risks, and look at the sampling behavior, just under simple random sampling error, they can be quite skewed not normal-esque. You might say, well, why is that everything else we looked at was nice and well-behaved? Well, it turns out, if you think about it, the range of possible values for, in quotes, negative and positive associations are very different. For the group on top to the group on the bottom, if the group on top has lesser risk than the group on the bottom, it results in a relative risk estimate somewhere between 0 and 1. And the range of possibilities for that scenario is between 0 and 1. Whereas if the opposite is true, the group on top has a higher risk than the group on the bottom, that can result in relative risk anywhere from 1 to positive infinity. So you can see there's an imbalance here in the range of possibilities for positive and negative associations. So when you look at the sampling behavior, there's a lot more room for variability on the right side of 1 than on the left side just by the numerical constraints on these measures. Well, it turns out if we log numbers that have that constraint, a smaller range on one side than the others, in that fashion, we actually equalize the ranges. So if I take the log of all numbers between 0 and 1, and we'll talk more about logarithms in the second term, so if you're rusty, just appreciate this for the moment. If I take the logarithm of numbers between 0 and 1, well, the log of 1, natural log of 1, is actually 0. So that 1 translates to a 0. And then the numbers going down to 0 on the ratio scale are all, on the log scale, less than 0. They're all negative. And actually, the closer our ratio gets to 0, the larger in magnitude the log ratio becomes, but negatively. So it approaches negative infinity. So in essence, by taking the log of numbers between 0 and 1, which is the range for negative associations on the ratio scale, we've turned that range into the entire negative number line. And when we do the same thing for the range for positive associations on the ratio scale between 1 and infinity or so, that just, now the log of 1 again is 0, and that just shifts over to 0. So things that are between 1 and infinity on the ratio scale become between 0 and infinity on the log scale. So the range of possibilities for positive associations on the log scale is the entire positive number line. So hopefully that makes some sense, how we've taken this thing that was incredibly disparate on the ratio scale and equalized it into the two halves of the real number line on the log scale. And now we have something that can behave more egalitarian in, in the sampling process and tends to be more symmetric and normal-esque. And now let me show you that, as such, all the inference and estimation for these things is done on the log ratio scale and then translated back to the ratio scale. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you the formulae for this in the, in the context of the standard 2x2 two two table setup. So recall this standard 2x2 two two table setup. You can change it, but just make sure the positions track with the same lettering so that you know what you're doing. But this is the one we've been using because it's the one Stata recognizes in all its commands for doing binary 2x2 two two data situations. So it turns out in this setup, the log of the relative risk is given by what we do is, you know, for two groups being compared, arbitrarily P1 to P2, we take P1 hat over P2 hat to get the estimated relative risk and then take the natural log of that. You can do that on the calculator. But then the standard error of this, estimated standard error of this log relative risk, how much this would bounce around from random samples to random samples of the same sizes taken multiple times, is given in putting the numbers from a 2 by 2 table in the following fashion, it's given by the square root of C, which is the 
number of persons in the exposure group who did not have the outcome divided by the number who did times the overall size of the exposed group. And then plus D, the number of persons in the unexposed group who did not have the outcome divided by the number who did times the size of the unexposed group. And this is the formula. It's actually not too hard to compute by hand. and involves all four cells of the 2 by 2 table plus the totals, in our case, the column totals. So if we then take the log relative risk estimate and add and subtract two standard errors of this log relative risk, we get a 95% confidence interval for the log of the true relative risk, which is great. We have a confidence interval for the log relative risk, but we don't really want that. We want a confidence interval for the relative risk on the ratio scale. So what we do is we exponentiate, take the natural constant E and raise it to the power of the endpoints for the confidence interval on the log scale. Let me show you an example. And we'll go back to the HIV mother-infant transmission example that we've worked with throughout this series of lectures. And this is the two-by-two two table setup we use for this. 180 HIV-positive mothers given AZT during pregnancy and 183 given placebo. So the log of the relative risk, remember the relative risk, we had 7% of the infants being infected within 18 months of birth in the AZT group compared to about 22% in the placebo group, which gave us a relative risk estimate of roughly 0.33. And the log of 0.33 is negative 1.11. Now, if we actually get the standard error for this using the counts from the 2 by 2 table, go through the math, and it turns out to be about 0.30. So to get a confidence interval for the log relative risk, we take our estimated log of our estimated relative risk, that uh, negative 1.11, add or subtract 2 times that standard error of 0.3, gives us a confidence interval of negative 1.71, negative 0.51. And then to get a 95% confidence interval for the relative risk itself, we exponentiate the endpoints, e to the negative 1.71 power, to e to the negative 0.51 power gives us a 95% confidence interval of 0.18 to 0 0.60. And that jives pretty well with what Stata gave us. The only differences are in slight rounding that I did that they don't do. But theirs runs from about 0.18 to about 0.60 as well. Well, let's look at the uh, same sort of thing goes on for odds ratios. If we look at the estimated log of an odds ratio from a single study with two samples, one from each population, well, the odds ratio is given by that formula there, P1 hat over 1 minus P1 hat divided by P2 hat over 1 minus P2 hat, and then we take the log of that ratio. Well, it turns out this is kind of a cool formula. The standard error using the counts from a 2 by 2 table of the log of the estimated odds ratio the estimated standard error is the square root of 1 over A plus 1 over B plus 1 over C plus 1 over D. So 1 over each of the counts in the 2 by 2 table added together. And then the 95% confidence interval for the log of this estimated odds ratio is we take that estimated odds ratio and add and subtract two standard errors of the estimated log of the odds ratio. And then we again exponentiate what we've got the confidence interval for the log of the odds ratio to get the confidence interval on the odds ratio scale. So again, in our HIV infant transmission example, the estimated odds ratio was about 0.28, the log of which is negative 1.27. The standard error using the counts from the 2 by 2 table in that formula I gave you turns out to be about 0.34. And the 95% confidence interval for the log of the odds ratio is that negative 1.27, the estimate plus or minus 2 times that estimated standard error of 0.34, gives us a 95% confidence interval for negative 1.96 to negative 0.60, and if we exponentiate those endpoints, we get a confidence interval for the odds ratio of about 0.14 to 0.55. And this method here, you'll see different methods depending on which program or subroutine you use in Stata, but this method with this standard error and this approach was invented by a statistician named Cornfield, and that's why you see, at least on the CSI command, that annotation to the odds ratio line that says cornfield. Sometimes you'll see other methods there that give slightly different answers. And 
ours works out to be close to what it is in Stata, but with a little bit of difference because of rounding on my part. So again, none of this you're responsible for, but hopefully it sheds some light on to where this comes from and why we need to do things on the log scale for ratios to incorporate sampling error.